Uh, welcome to a new talk that's part of the Understanding 2 conference. This is a special talk. Uh, David Bouget is going to um, talk to us about the cognitive role of consciousness. David, I believe this is also the title of a paper of yours. And so I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this is uh, progressed uh, meanwhile. I have to say, for those of you who missed um, uh, the Understanding 1 conference in May, where David was kind enough to give a talk that um, I there recounted um, uh, something, um, um, an episode in my own uh, sort of becoming an understanding, right? Uh, one of the very first papers in understanding that I bumped into was a paper by David about understanding and grasping in PPR. And that was really uh, the jump start for my PhD thesis. So I'm very grateful for that, David. I, I'll keep embarrassing you every moment. Uh, every time we you give a talk by by opening with, with that, it was really spectacular. It got me thinking. I never agreed with a single line you wrote until I started thinking better. <laughs> and then I started agreeing. So let's see the cognitive role of consciousness. Professor David Bouget from Western University, Ontario. Thank you, Andre. Um, thanks for inviting me and organizing this uh, amazing event again. Um, yeah, so this is not actually the same title as the paper that you have in mind. It's the rational role of consciousness. But yeah, I kind of I have a, a bunch of generic sounding titles that I keep reusing. Um, so um, the goal of this talk, let's see if I can change the slides, yeah, is to um, uh, make this point that uh, phenomenal experiences play a key role uh, in uh, and being our means of attaining a certain kind of understanding or grasp of propositions. So that sounds like things I've said before, but um, as I clarify the, the kind of understanding that I have in mind here, you will see that this is sort of a new point. Uh, so here's an illustration, a model of what I'm talking about. Here we go, a grasp. So let's start with some background on that notion of grasping that I'm uh, employing here. So I believe there's a difference between merely knowing or believing or thinking that P, a proposition, and grasping it. Uh, this is a contrast that I believe comes up quite prominently in the literature on understanding, where many people, as uh, Stephen Grimm has pointed out, found themselves appealing to some notion of grasping and spelling out what understanding is. So understanding, say, a model ends up being a matter of grasping a bunch of things. So the notion of grasping I'm interested in is the same as that, but I prefer to fix ideas uh, through examples. And in the talk that I gave in the previous uh, conference of that series, I went through some four examples in detail. And here, I'm just gonna sort of uh, remind you of two or introduce you to two if you were not there for the other talk. So the first example is the sun case. Um, you may already know, but I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you anyways that the sun is 1.3 million times larger in volume, sorry, sorry, it should be volume, not volumes, than the earth. Now that I've reminded you of this or taught you this fact, you can, uh, you believe it and you can easily think it. But I believe there is a, a clear sense in which just being told this is not sufficient for grasping the fact in question. And that becomes clear when you're shown a model like this, uh, a scale model or illustration that actually allows you to grasp the, the proportions. My second example is derived from Jackson's black and white Mary thought experiment. Um, this is not part of, a, of, of, of Jackson's thought experiment per se, it's not a key part of his argument, of his knowledge argument, but it's very natural to suppose that while Mary is in a black and white room, uh, she's not able to have any experiences of colors whatsoever, not even in imagination. So, and it's natural further to suppose, and that's not, not also part of a, also not part of the knowledge argument, but it's natural to suppose that because of that, she can't fully grasp certain claims about colors, any claims about colors, like, the claim that fire trucks are red in London, Ontario. While that seems plausible, it's also clear that Mary has no problem believing these claims. If you tell her, 
that fire trucks are, are red in London, Ontario, then she knows this claim, she believes it, and she can think it, no problem. So the point is that, that this example and the previous example we'll make is that grasping seems to be something above and beyond mere belief or, or thought or mental representation in general. It's a special kind of, uh, of thought. So what's special about it? There are three main ways that um, you might try to explain what's special about grasping a proposition. My preferred way is what I call experientialism. And that's the view that I've sort of uh, expounded in some detail in the talk that I gave previously. On this view, grasping a proposition is roughly a matter of experiencing it. Now, of course, this presupposes that you can experience propositions. And I believe you can because experience is a kind of representation. And by that, I mean that uh, an experience as a structure of a relationship to possible states of affairs. This is stuff that I've you know, defended and in, 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 uh, detailed in, in previous works. I'm not gonna go into that today. Today, I'm gonna look more closely at the other side, uh, at the other kind of explanation, the two other um, uh, possible accounts of grasping fall under what I call under the heading of what I call inferentialism. The first of these uh, approaches um, is that uh, tries to explain grasping roughly in terms of inferential dispositions. If you take you know inferences or inferential dispositions, you take a very broad view of that to include any kinds of transitions between thoughts. Uh, most of the views of grasping that have been suggested or that I'm reading in people's work, including the people listed here, uh, fall under that category. So this seems to be sort of the most natural view, uh, the most, uh, at least for most people. Uh, this is not the view that I'm going to talk about today. Today I want to talk about an alternative to this, which is what I call causal inferentialism. Causal inferentialism old roughly that to grasp a proposition, uh, grasping a proposition is a matter of, or is grounded in the having of a, of a representation of the proposition that can in practice be efficacious in reasoning, query representation of that content. I'm gonna call a cognitive grasp uh, a representation that's efficacious in reasoning. So the point is that Grasping uh, is, is cognitively grasping. It's a specific kind of understanding of grasping that involves having a representation that you can, um, in a sense, uh, manipulate. And this, this view makes it more kind of a, precisifies what it is to manipulate a, a content. It's to be, it's having a representation that's actually doing something in, in your reasoning. I believe there are two uh, reasonable motivations for this view. One is that I was, as I was just suggesting, it does justice to the intuition that grasping is a matter of being able to manipulate and to behold a content in a way that is especially useful and potent. And this, this sort of vague idea doesn't dictate causal inferentialism, but causal inferentialism, as I just specified, is a way of precisifying this vague idea to make it kind of more testable. Uh, so that's, I think, is one reason to be attracted to this view. The other reason is that this kind of account does justice to an apparent connection between grasping and, in, in, and inferential abilities without you know, falling into the pitfalls of inferential dispositions, which I've detailed in, in prior work. So this is sort of, I guess I, it would be helpful for me to clarify here that what I'm telling you now is sort of a strand in a sort of multi-pronged argument for the experientialist view that I like. And this is, I'm kind of telling you the part where I'm ruling out one of, one of the views, causal inferentialism, right? And in my broader kind of picture, the other views are, other alternatives to my preferred view are ruled out in different ways. So I'm just focusing on that, focusing on that strand. All right, so I think it's a decent position. And in fact, uh, I'm not really gonna argue against it. I'll, I'll more on that in a second. 
for now, I want to address sort of a, a worry that uh, one might have. Uh, you might think this, this notion of cognitive grasp seems like a non-starter. Uh, so there are people who think that way. Uh, Folder famously doesn't believe anything like that. Okay, he has his reasons. But I don't think his reasons are, are widely shared or should be widely shared. I think there is a prima facie case that there is such a thing as cognitive grasp or representations that are efficacious in reasoning. Uh, this is something that we seem to kind of believe in naturally right, as part of our folk psychology. So for example, when I started up my Zoom earlier, it wasn't as smooth as this example <laughs> suggests, but yeah, when I start open, when I formed the intention of opening my Zoom earlier, uh, I did so because, and it seems to be a causal because, because I wanted to attend the conference and I believed that I had to open Zoom to attend the conference. So, you know, in our ordinary sort of explanations of behavior or, or, or thinking, we tend to assume something like that. It seems that the belief and the desires, you know, the whole of it, including the content, not just some kind of vehicle that we don't see, uh, was efficacious in bringing about my intention. Um, so there is, you know, it's not, not an unreasonable position to hold. And furthermore, and I think this is in fact a more powerful reason in the end, uh, if mental representations evolved, if thoughts evolved, and it really seems that they did, right? They must have been doing something that they were selected for doing. They must have been, uh, been playing some kind of causal role. Uh, and obviously kind of bouncing around, uh, bumping into each other, uh, and the reasoning process seems to be the, the key role that thoughts play. So I don't think it's unreasonable to believe that there is such a thing as cognitive grasp. In, uh, in, in, uh, in this talk anyways, I'm taking this, this position sort of in stride. What I wanna do, I wanna do a kind of a judo move. I'm, uh, I'm using the strength of the opponent to my advantage. Um, so what I wanna do is take it roll with the position and argue that, yes, maybe there is such a thing as cognitive grasp, okay? But if there is, it is grounded in phenomenal experience. The only way that you can cognitively grasp a proposition, to have a proposition sort of, uh, a, re a representation of a proposition be efficacious in reasoning is if you're experiencing the proposition. So, and my overall position isn't that grasping is identical to experience, it's that it's grounded in experience. To grasp P, you have to experience P. By grounding here, I mean that something obtains at least in part in virtue of something else. So, so I'm gonna roll with the position and, and simply kind of, uh, my, my judo metaphor is running out now, uh, simply, you know, uh, give a, a deeper account of what's going on. That's what I, I'm, I'm trying to do. Okay. So I noticed that this claim that uh, cognitive grasp is grounded in experience is a, is a contingent claim. I'm not trying to give an account of sort of necessary conditions for grasping. I, I, don't, I don't care if beings and other possible worlds can grasp differently than we do. So here's the top level argument uh, that I want to make. That's the main argument that I want to make. The first premise is that every actual representing of P, and by representing here, I mean an event of representing a content, every actual representing falls in one or more of the three categories on the slide. Uh, the first category is being grounded in wide relations to things in the environment. That's what mental representations are like according to externalist theories of content. The second category is being grounded in narrow functional role, where functional role is causal patterns between internal things. And the last category is being grounded in an experience of a content. It could be that, according to some theory, uh, representing representings fall into more than one category because they involve more than one ingredient, especially A and B are so often combined. The second premise is that representings in categories A and B cannot be efficacious in reasoning. And so trivially then uh, only representings that are grounded in experiences of P 
our, our cognitive grasp of P. Uh, I'm not going to defend premise one. I think it, it's just kind of, it just falls out of the fact that it's supported by the fact that as far as I know, and I've read widely on this, nobody has suggested a theory of content on which mental representations are not grounded in, uh, in the ways described by A, B, or C. Um, uh, so I'm going to be focusing uh, here most, mostly on defending P2 and especially in, in talking about, in, in the case, uh, I'm going to fo focus mostly on the case of wide representations. Before I start here, I want to acknowledge that uh, many philosophers uh, I've argued persuasively that wide mental states can be efficacious. They're not epiphenomenal and they can be efficacious in behavior. Uh, this is a point that, uh, among others, Yablo, Williamson, and Burge made. I think they're right. And most people who have written about this are respond to Fodor's muddled arguments uh, uh, against the efficacy of, of why mental states and behavior. Uh, I, I allow myself to call them models because, model because Fodor himself uh, describes them as incomprehensible. So, um, so, uh, so, okay, so this is all good, but uh, so I grant this, but I believe there's a special problem with why mental states being efficacious in reasoning proper. Okay, so uh, to see that we have to start by clarifying what would it be, what would it take to be efficacious in reasoning? Um, to start, we can say that the mental state is efficacious in some reasoning leading to some mental state, just in case it is part of a causal reasoning process that accumulates in the mental states. That seems like a truism. The real question is, what is a causal reasoning process? Or as I will just, I will just say, a, a reasoning process. Uh, as a first shot, you might think that a reasoning process is a directed graph of states of the subject that are connected by causal relevance as depicted here. Mm -hmm. But there's a problem with this as, our, as I've here <laughs> clearly illustrated. Uh, the problem is that, uh, for example, my having eaten this morning as shown in the picture uh, is a state of me that is causally relevant to many of my thoughts. Uh, if I had not eaten, I would probably have collapsed and not have had these uh, various thoughts, right? So, but it's not part of a reasoning process leading to the thoughts. It's not part of my reasoning proper. Okay, so what if we restrict the mental relevant states to mental states? Uh, then does that work? Well, now that's, that's too narrow uh, because you might reasonably think that some intermediary neural states uh, deep in my brain are part of my reasoning process, but they're not mental states proper. Okay, so then what? Well, it seems that the solution here is to uh, include all and only the states uh, of a subject's reasoning machinery, as I'm going to put it. The re a subject's reasoning machinery includes the whole of their brains and all the constituents of their mental states, if those go beyond the brain. And just to be sort of inclusive and be safe, uh, let's include any other mechanisms that are part that support extended cognition. So that meet Clark and Chalmers criterion for contributing to one's extended cognition. Let's call states of uh, any of these things cognitive states. So then we can say that a reasoning process is a directed graph of cognitive states of the subject connected by causal relevance. There's still a problem with this as illustrated here. Uh, suppose that uh, there is a mad neuroscientist that is uh, L bent on implanting plans to travel to Barbados in everybody who thinks about thought experiments. And here I am um, thinking about the twinner thought experiment. The mad scientist picks that up and then implants uh, Barbados travel plan in my head. 
The counterexample here is the graph that's made up simply of my, my Twinner thought and my Barbados intention. Given the setup, my Barbados thought is causally, sorry, my, my Twinner thought is, is causally relevant to my Bar Barbados travel plan because if I had not thought about twin earth, I would not have had that intention. The problem is that there is an intermediary here that makes that not really a reasoning process. Seems, it seems that this is not a reasoning process, it's something else. The obvious fix is to require all links in the graph to not be mediated by non-cognitive states of the subject. If we call a link that is not mediated by a, a non-cognitive state of the subject, a cognitive step, we can then say that a reasoning process is a directed graph formed exclusively of cognitive steps. And now that's starting to look usable. So I'm gonna go with that for the time being until somebody points out a clever counterexample, preferably an illustrated one. All right, so go going back to why states, uh, they are not, notice first that they're not a priori ruled out from being part of reasoning processes as just uh, defined. The reason is that their constituents are cognitive states, they and their constituents are cognitive states, okay, so they can be part of the graph. And it's conceivable that they are causally relevant to other cognitive states in ways that are not mediated by non-cognitive states. My, uh, my argument against why mental states being efficacious in reasoning is going to turn on a contingent constraint, which is the locality of causation. That's a contingent empirical constraint we learned about from physics. I'm going, to, I'm going to suggest that given the locality of causation, the causal relevance of why mental states to other mental states uh, has to be mediated by non-cognitive states. So that's why why mental states cannot in practice be causally efficacious in reasoning. And again, I wanna warn you that this is not Fodor's argument. Fodor talks about locality, uses the word locality. It's not clear what role locality plays in his argument, which mostly has to do with scientific uh, practices of individuation of concepts. And um, this is not Fodor's argument. So what is locality? Well, I take it that uh, it's a basic empirical finding that something like this locality principle here is the case. If a fundamental event C is causally relevant to another fundamental event E, then C and E are part of a causal path where a causal path is a set of fundamental events that form a chain of causal relevance tracing an uninterrupted path in space time. So this is a, an empirical finding that it's been verified over and over again uh, with the possible exception of quantum mechanics you can talk about in Q&A if you want but I don't think quantum mechanics is relevant here. Uh, so uh, even, even Newton's gravity uh, turned out to, to respect the principle uh, even though he thought it was sort of mis a mysterious form of action to the distance initially it turned out it turns out the gravity spreads in space-time as a field at the speed of light even it respects locality. So, uh, so that's all good, but locality doesn't directly apply to uh, things like mental events because it's about fundamental events. You might think it's somehow relevant, but exactly how relevant uh, is not entirely clear to start with. Uh, so if we have to do a bit more work to see how that's relevant. I suggest that um, locality is relevant to what I'm gonna call high level causation causation between non-fundamental events uh, because uh, eye level causation doesn't flow free from fundamental causation. So that's called uh, the, the parts of the grounds of eye level events, the, 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 the facts in virtue of which these eye level events obtain. Uh, let's part, call the parts of these facts, the constituents of high level events. I want to suggest some link between uh, eye-level events and fundamental events to make the 
to bring local, make locality relevant to uh, high level causation. To uh, illustrate this, let's look at an example. Uh, suppose there is a throwing event that uh, causes the breaking of a glass. The throwing as, uh, as, for, cons as for constituents, uh, the acceleration of lots of particles, and similarly for the breaking of the glass. Somehow, it seems plausible that somehow the causal relationship between the throwing and the window breaking is uh, somehow derivative of or grounded in causal relationships between the two clouds of particles below. And the question is exactly what's that relationship? Here's a template for thinking about this. Uh, it seems the relationship has to follow roughly this template where Q1 and Q2 are quantifiers that we need to fill in. If a non-fundamental event C is causally relevant to some non-fundamental event E, then some or every constituent of C is causally relevant or identical to some or every constituent of E. Uh, notice that I put or identical in parentheses because shared constituents don't need to be causation related. So then the question is what uh, quantifier I should go in there? We have four combinations. I think we can rule out uh, some in the first position because that would be way too broad. That would mean that whenever there is uh, causation between uh, two events, then uh, there's also causation between uh, the second event and an event that has the first event as a proper part. And you can go really big, uh, you can expand really big. So for example, uh, the throwing uh, is causally relevant to the window breaking. Uh, the throwing has uh, shares constituents with uh, a throwing while uh, a dog is barking outside five miles away. Um, and, but that, you know, Throwing while a throwing while the dog a dog is barking outside five miles away is clearly not causal relevant to the window breaking. So we need to say every in the first position. Now I think we can rule out every in the second position because that's too demanding. That requires an extremely tight connection between cause and effect at a high level. Every particle of the cause has to affect every particle every little constituent of the effect, and that's way too demanding. So the right, the right view seems to be uh, every in the first position and some in the second, which gives us a principle that I'm gonna call downward mediation. If a non-fundamental event C is causally relevant to some non-fundamental event E, every constituent of C is causally relevant or identical to some constituent of E. So every constituent of the effect and the constituents are the fundamental events that ground the, that, sorry, of the cause, the constituents are the fundamental events that cause the, ground the cause has to do something to the effect. All right. Uh, now, if we combine uh, generalized locality, uh, sorry, look, our locality principle with our downward mediation principle, and we also stipulate just for ease of exposition that uh, fundamental events or constituents of themselves, um, we get what I call your generalized locality. If event C is causally relevant to some event E, every constituent of C that is not also a constituent of E is at the origin of a causal path to some constituent of E. Okay, so so that's 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 what you get logically when you combine the two the two principles. And I want to stress that. This is only meant to be uh, a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition on high level causation uh, or any causation. And it's also not meant to be uh, metaphysically necessary. It's at best nomologically necessary. All right, so let's back, get back to mental states. Uh, a wide mental state has both internal and external constituents. The internal constituents are you know, representational vehicles, something like neural firings that content attaches to. And then the external constituents uh, are external events uh, in virtue of which vehicles have content. 
the external constituents are going to vary depending on what uh, semantic with what, what uh, broad theory of content you consult. Uh, let's just use a Taylor semantic theory as an example. On this kind of view, uh, the, you have their historical long, long past uh, evolutionary events that constitute the fact that vehicles have certain representational functions, evolutionary functions, and that's what representation is. Uh, that's what grounds representation. So you see here a little squirrel uh, escaping uh, a tarx, and that's uh, part of the ground for my having certain thoughts. Okay. Now, the thing is that it's very unlikely, not in principle impossible, but extremely unlikely that external constituents of white mental states can affect any constituents of other mental states, whether they're white or not, without the mediation of non cognitive events. Take, for example, this uh, long past evolutionary event of the squirrel escaping the tarx. Uh, if, this is, if this event is causally relevant to anything going on in my head or to any external events that ground other, uh, that are part of the of the grounds of other mental states, it's through causal connections in the environment that are not that are not constituents of any mental states, plausibly, like the squirrel then giving birth to more squirrel-like creatures and so on, as you see depicted here. So that that uh, that path through the environment is not a cognitive step, and that's why that's why the um, why mental states cannot be efficacious in reasoning. There is a path plausibly uh, from the squirrel to my mental representations, a very complicated sort of diffuse one, but there is some path of causal relevance. But it's not the kind of path that makes for uh, reasoning. So that's why, uh, why mental states are not efficacious in reasoning. So yeah, as I as I as I keep uh, repeating, <laughs> why mental states can be causal efficacious because there's a path, but it's not uh, it's not the right kind of path to make for a reasoning process. So now we're in a position to rule out category A, and I'm going to talk super briefly about category B before wrapping up. Uh, so the the idea here is that. Maybe uh, cognitive grasp is grounded in, in representations that are uh, uh, that involve uh, that, that are partly grounded in narrow functional role. Now, uh, uh, usually, um, this kind of view is combined with uh, uh, an, an appeal to external relations as well to help to kind of pin down the contents because narrow functional role is well known because it seems to determine. The, the contents of non-logical concepts or terms. There are many problems here, uh, but we can't appeal to external relationships here because that we would we'd run a full of the, the problem just pointed out. So we have to consider sort of a pure narrow functional role theory of content. And on this kind of theory, then the causal interactions between mental states determine, are supposed to fully determine their contents. So, uh, so one thing I have to point out is that kind of theory is very implausible. Almost nobody holds this, this kind of view of content. But in any case, the important point that is sort of germane to our, our, our discussion here is that uh, downward mediation actually generalizes, the argument from downward mediation actually generalizes to it. The thing is that if narrow functional, uh, if mental events, mental representations have content in virtue of narrow functional role, uh, it's, it's very plausible that almost all of the connections between vehicles in the brain are, are, are relevant to fixing the contents. You need a lot of connections to plausibly end up fixing content. That's the sort of infamous holism of narrow functional role. But then that means that, um, that means that these, uh, these mental representations are not efficacious in reasoning because in order for one of these mental representation was ground as your whole brain basically to be uh, to be efficacious in an episode of reasoning 
it would have to be that all its constituents are, 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 are relevant to the effect. If you have a transition between two mental states and it would have to be the case that all of the constituents of the first of the starting state are, are causally relevant to some constituents by downward mediation of the effect, right? But the constituents of the cause span the whole brain. And, you know, we, we don't think that if you have every, every bit of reasoning goes through the whole brain, kind of like touching all the connections. So it seems, it seems implausible, again, that uh, uh, mental states that are constituted that are grounded in that way are actually efficacious in reasoning. So we're in a position to rule out category B as well. And that leaves us with only category C, mental states that are grounded in experience. And that, that concludes the argument. The only possible, given the empirical constraints that we know about, the, the only possible grounds of our presentations that would be efficacious in reasoning and in some sense allow us to manipulate content, to have a good sort of grip on it, uh, would be uh, representations that are representations that are grounded in experiences. So that concludes my argument. And let me leave you with a little plug for, I hope, an upcoming book that I'm working on uh, called Grasping the Cognitive Role of Consciousness, which will explore this line of argument and many others. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, David. This has been absolutely amazing. I'm sure everyone in the audience is joining me using the virtual applause button. And uh, I've got many, well, one or two questions of my own. Um, but before I say anything, I'd uh, very much like to uh, give way to all those in meeting who would like to uh, ask a question themselves. So if you'd like to raise your virtual hand or if you'd like to make yourselves known in chat, that would be ideal. Uh, Vladi, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I, I've got several questions, but for now, uh, uh, one comment I, I'd like to address. Uh, your analogy uh, about um, inserted uh, um, uh, in, inserted uh, intention to, uh, for a trip to Barbados. Well, it, it, you showed it as an analogy uh, um, for not reasoning, but actually uh, we can uh, think about it uh, the other way. Uh, for instance, when uh, it's not a process of reasoning for a person uh, uh, whose, whose mind uh, uh, was uh, sabotaged by this way, it was a part of the scientist's reasoning why he wanted to insert uh, that idea that everyone who experienced the thought experiment uh, uh, should want to trip to Barbados. So, uh, well, uh, it, it could be um, seen as a part of, well, extended cognition and extended reasoning. Uh, what do you think about it? So uh, it, it's not a process of reasoning by the, the agent himself, but it's uh, a, a process of reasoning uh, done by uh, med scientists and then inserted it to you. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so could we count? Could we count the process as sort of uh, an episode of reasoning uh, of the system made of of the of, of me and the, the mad scientists, and I guess the whatever medium is used in between as well. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that would be okay. That you know. I, I mean, I think that's kind of a, a slightly deviant use of the word reasoning, if you, or or, or cognitive uh, cognitive agent or whatever we use to fix the scope of the the, the reasoning machinery or agent. Uh, but you know, if you want, I'm not going to quibble with terminology. The point is just that it's not an episode of reasoning for me. Hmm. Well, okay. <laughs> um... Uh, the other the part I really wanted to address is uh, uh, what uh, in your terms means uh, uh, to experiencing P. What, uh, uh, what is enough sufficient to say is that we, we are actually experiencing P, not just uh, having its representation in our mind. 
And that's the, the trillion dollar question. Um, I don't have a theory of experience, but I can give you examples to kind of, you know, give you a sense of what I'm talking about, just to clarify the terminology. Right? So, uh, so right now I'm looking down my window and I'm experiencing trees, but I'm not experiencing pink elephants. Uh, if I if I take a certain drug, I might experience pink elephants. Uh, um, these experiences are these sort of felt, you know, uh, episodes that are typically triggered by perception, uh, but not you know not exclusively. So um, I hope that that helps. But if we uh, cannot uh, rationalize uh, them that way. Uh, we, we we can still have some experiences, right? Uh, some experiences we are not aware of, don't we? Uh, haven't we? So you're asking if there are experiences that we're not aware of having, like, like yeah. subconscious experiences? Yes, I, exactly. I think... If you include it in your uh, point of view, or or you don't. That's an empirical question, and I'm inclined to say that the answer is yes. There are experiences that you can't introspect, right? Uh, but it's you know it's a tricky empirical question, and there are lots of considerations that go into that. All right, thank you so thank much, you. Adi and David for answering. Next up, we have a question from Chris. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, that was really interesting. My question is uh, about contradictions. Um, so, so it seems to me as though there are some contradictions that I can grasp and others that I can't because they're maybe too complex for my like, you know, simple and uh, uh, limited mind to grasp but other people might be able to write uh, some contradictions that we can grasp but our students can't and so on. Um, so now, if this grasping is a matter of experiencing, do you want to say that we can experience the contradictions we grasp uh, or, or how does it work? Um, I mean, so it looks to me as though there's a distinction that you need between uh, contradictions we can grasp and understand and so on and others that we can't because we're like too limited, right? But I, I find it sort of difficult to see how that difference might be unpacked in terms of experiences. Um, and I was hoping that you might be able to help me uh, see my way to uh, 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 an answer that I might just be too limited to, to, to see from where I stand, thanks. Thanks, that's a really interesting question. I, I wanna know what example you have in mind because I, I actually think this doesn't mean part of, this wasn't part of this talk or, or in fact, anything that I published, but I actually think that you can't experience contradictions. And I don't think, you, and, for, and consequently, I think you can't grasp contradictions. So I wanna kind of look at that example that you have in mind to see uh, you know, uh, what I should say about it. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess. I guess then the question might be one of of what, what. I mean, like you know, I can I can certainly reason from contradictions, right? I can like you know apply the principle of explosion and so on, right? Um, um, so, so I guess then I'm wondering what grasping is. Uh, so, so I, I so my thought was that grasping is the sort of thing that we have when we can reason from stuff. Now I can reason from contradictions, right? Um, so, so if I can't grasp them, then I'm wondering what, what grasping is such that, like, you know, it, it, it doesn't apply to contradictions, even though I can reason from them. Yeah, fair, fair question. So, well, so grasping is, um, is the, 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 the thing that is missing in the, in, in, in the A case of my examples and in present in the B case, right? So I thought two, these two examples contrasting conditions where you fail to grasp and, and conditions where you grasp. And in, in other work, I go through more examples that today I was just kind of going quickly. Um, but I have sort of a, a set of kind of paradigm example of grasping and I'm defining grasping ostensibly as whatever it is that's, you know, the, the it underlies the contrast between these cases. Um, and it, but it's certainly not, you know, uh, whenever you can reason about something, you grasp it. That's, uh, so part of my position is that uh, we do a lot of reasoning without grasping. It's, I call that empty thought, empty cognition. And a lot of this is just manipulating symbols. And so you think, oh, assume P and not P, you know, and then I know, you're just playing with symbols. You don't really grasp the content. 
So this is sort of the, 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 the view that I take on, on, on these kind of uh, scenarios that you're thinking about here. I'd just like to uh, interject a quick follow-up to, to Chris's question because uh, uh, and I wonder if the, if the contra case of contradictions might be a bit more puzzling for the view you're, you're putting on offer, David. So um, uh, if we just consider um, uh, Frege's reaction to Russell's paradox, right? So Russell sends a letter and uh, I'm, I'm just, um, uh, summarizing, uh, sort of um, uh, glossing over a lot of niceties, but if you take Hume's principle and if it, any class can uh, have a number of elements, then it would seem to follow that every class is an extension. And so it would seem to follow that every class of classes that are in members of themselves also has an extension. And so you bottom out in contradiction directly. Uh, Frege and many others have thought um, this is a perfectly clear and safe uh, foundation for uh, mathematics. And then lo and behold, there's Russell's paradox. It would seem as though there's something genuine going on when people discover this, that there is something that they experience, a felt conflict that wasn't there before. Um, and um, is this part of what it is to gain a conscious appraisal of a contradiction or? That's a really interesting example. And I, I, I'm probably gonna have to think more about it before I can give a, a really complete uh, uh, answer to that. Um, so, but to start with, it seems to me that when you, you contemplate something like Hume's principle, uh, this is sort of extremely abstract. I don't think you can grasp that. So this is like, we have a lot of our reasoning uh, happens through manipulations of sort of linguistic-like structures, linguistic schemas and logical form. Um, and, uh, and this is just what, what you're doing when you're doing this kind of stuff. And there, there is no grasp, you're just doing syntactic work. What you experience is syntactic structure, not, not actual like, uh, classes, all the classes. No, you know, you don't experience all the classes. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, so, so uh, you know, the classes essentially have their elements as part of them, right? So, you cannot experience all the classes. So, all you're doing is some kind of syntactic manipulations, uh, and that's why that's why this is you know not a counterexample to that suggested principle that you can only grasp that that you cannot grasp or experience contradictions. Uh, there are more plausible, uh, you know, apparent counterexamples to that, like um, like the waterfall illusions and things like that. Before anybody brings this up, you know, I know that. Uh, uh, so, so anyway, so and then what happens after that? You know, can you grasp the contradiction in the end? Um, this I'm not, you know, I'm not 100% clear on what happens after this. I need to think about, you know, think about the, the example in more in slightly more detail. But you know, I think I think you. Uh, um, no, you can't really grasp the, the, the contradiction. You will reach, you will reach, you know, a formal contradiction. Um, you will certainly grasp, you know, like you, you, you get a formula that has a form P and not P, so that contradiction. And, and you call that a contradiction and that syntactic form, you grasp the form, but you don't grasp the contradictoriness, the impossibility, right? The, the thing being square and not square at the same time, you don't, because you can't picture it. And, you know, part of my, 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 my overall view uh, uh, is that, you know, consciousness is, is, is uh, all of experience is the same in nature as, as perception. So there's not, you know, there's not a different kind that may be open to contradiction and you can't perceive, you can't sort of visualize a square and non-square at the same time. And I think this is the, this, that would be the same thing in general. All right, plenty, plenty of food for thought there. Um, next up, we have a question from Bruce Russell. Professor Russell, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, my, I have a comment on the contradiction uh, issue too, but I think I'll put that aside. Maybe I don't get two comments. So my other one's about causality. Couldn't there be a sum-sum relationship when it comes to non-fundamental causality? An example I have in mind is suppose somebody fires a shotgun and kills someone or some animal. So the pellets 
are actually entering the, the animal's body and does something to some vital organs, say. And so the firing, there are many pellets. Those are the constituents of the shot, but they're, they're just some of the constituents that actually cause the death of the animal. So that's, I'm trying to offer that as one, as an example where there's a some, some relationship uh, in causality. Interesting example. Let, let me think about this for a second. Um, yeah, so the thought is that, um, say there are many pellets, that's why you're talking about a shotgun. So some of the pellets may just like miss the target. Yeah. Right. Um, Don't hit but, a vital organ or, yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, but the, the, the shooting of the shotgun as for constituents among other things, all the pellets, all the particles of all the pellets. Right? right. So it's a really broad ground and some of it kind of misses the, is not relevant. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, I think I have to say about something like this, I have to kind of fine grain, like it's not really the shooting of the shotgun per se. It's, you know, the, I mean, well, it could be the, the shooting, if it depends on you cut things kind of temporarily uh, in part. Because if you, if you think of the shooting as just push, pressing the trigger, right? And that, that may be, you know, that, call, that is causally relevant to the, you know, the, the, the weapon firing. Um, and, and then you can, but the, the trigger, all the constituent of the pressing the trigger may be causally relevant to uh, through like one pellet to the death. You can draw, uh, you know, all you need is if, if, what, if you, what you call the shooting is just the pressing the trigger, that's a relatively uh, narrow uh, event uh, in, in sort of space time. And you may you be able to- as the firing of the, the firing of the gun, but I don't know. That doesn't necessarily involve, you know, pressing the trigger. That's a normal way, but suppose this shell comes out somehow. I don't know. The, 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 you you throw the gun down, the butt of the gun, I don't know, causes the the yeah. to fire and whatever without pulling the trigger. So there's yeah. many ways to actually get the firing of the of the shell, but you know, standardly, of course, it's the trigger, but yeah, I mean, we just have to, we have to fix on one example because, you know, the, the my story is going to be different depending on the examples. So you change this example midway, like, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, like, so assuming a normal firing, right? So then I'm, I'm focusing on if the firing is, the firing is really just the pressing the trigger. And uh, then you can, you can draw a, a, there's a causal path, I think, between from all the, the constituents of, of that to the death through one pellet. This is assume one pellet, it's a critical organ. The other is just going to fan out. Um, um, it's sufficient that there is a causal path through, uh, through one pellet. You don't have to because the, 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 the ground of the, the cause is just, uh, it's just that, it's just a trigger. Now we can discuss another example, but I think something similar could be said where um, yeah, where if you go back, if, you're, if your cause is back enough, it's not going to be that hard to find uh, some relevance for all the, all the constituents of the cause. But if you, if you take the cause to be like the flying pellets, uh, then that's clearly, then that's not going to satisfy my test, but that seems like the right judgment because the flying pellets are not all relevant. Some of them miss the target. Right? I'm just afraid you're going to end up having to go back to not to fundamental rather than non-fundamental examples. Because I think ultimately the even the one about breaking the glass that maybe some of the parts of the ball don't actually have any causal efficacy. But then you say, oh no, no, but what if we look at those particular particles that did? It's then just like the shotgun, the move you're making about the shotgun. And I'd say, well, okay, ultimately you're saying you're, I think you're gonna have to get back to saying, well, when it comes to fundamental causality, you know, there's uh, something that's really doing the cause. I don't know. So about, about this example, hear, I yeah. think it's actually different. Yeah. So uh, the throwing, you know, I, I, I think you can, you can find, uh, so the key is that the ground of the effect uh, is as fine grain as the ground of the cause. And so it includes all these particles in the particular, you know, trajectories. Uh, so as soon as, 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 as long as uh, a particle of the cause has any influence on the trajectory of the particles of the, of the window, 
by right? it's having some causal relevance to the effect. Because I'm thinking of the of the grounds as maximally fine grained. There's exactly this exact you know state of affairs that grounds the the high level effect. So it may not the particles may not be relevant to may not be relevant directly to the window breaking. You, know, you can't say oh if that it's, it's not through that if that particle ended up being there and the and the ball uh, the window wouldn't have broken. But it's through that the if the particle and not being there and the and the and the and the ball as the 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 window breaking would have been slightly different the ground would have been different so it does have a causal relevance to the constituent of the effect so that's uh, you know that's why i think this is a uh, that's the example is that is like at least confirms the principle all right, thanks so much, uh, both to Professor Russell and to David for answering. And we have a follow-up from Chris. Chris, please go ahead. Yeah, just very briefly, I was uh, thinking about uh, along similar lines, but, but with different examples, like, you know, these sort of very broad scale uh, uh, events, right? I mean, Brexit, Brexit caused a, 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 a dispute over fisheries or something like that, right? I mean, you know, I mean, Brexit is just a very big event, right? And, and you might, I mean, it, it, of course you can then say, well, look, you know, there's only a part or something like that of Brexit that's really doing the causal role. But um, I mean, it, it does seem as though we wanna, we wanna say these things like Brexit caused this fishing dispute um, and, and like, you know, maybe sort of then saying, well, that's not really what's going on. What's going on is something quite different um, might not be the, the, the most attractive thing to, to say for everybody. But that, that similar, similar thought, just a different type of example. Yeah, that's an interesting case. I think what I want to say about that is that Brexit is not as diffuse as, let's not confuse Brexit and its consequences, right? So Brexit per se is like, I don't know exactly how it was done, but like it's Boris Johnson saying, you know, putting his signature on some document. That's like what actually affects Brexit or something like that, or the, or the parliament, you know, finalizing a vote, something. Uh, so that's like relatively, you know, relatively local. I'm kind of doing the same thing as with the shotgunning and going back to the actual, uh, the actual, uh, the actual ground of, 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 the, of the cause, right? And, uh, and I think it is plausible that you can find a causal path from, from, from all, the, all the grounds uh, of, of that to uh, some influence, you know, are very minute uh, to the, the 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 dispute about fisheries. Um, so now, if if you know so and so had not voted, then uh, you know Brexit would not have taken place, and um, and uh, then the, 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 you know the, the, the dispute would have been uh, different. Or uh, I mean, it's like a really difficult case, obviously. But uh, so um, yeah. I guess I don't have time to try to go into more detail on this. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chris and David. And I see there is another question from Kagman in chat. Um, uh, David, if you'd uh, be so kind, uh, we might uh, discuss this over a short break. I think we're already in overtime. And I had a question of my own, but maybe we might discuss it um, uh, again over the break, or maybe I'll send you an email or something. Um, so um, let's uh, take a quick five minute break with uh, apologies to Daniel. Um, and we'll come back at 6.05 for um, uh, his talk. And meanwhile, if you wanna stick around uh, uh, three or four minutes to, to chat with David over the break, if if he agrees and <laughs> if you're prepared with water and so on there. So uh, thanks once again, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a privilege. So please join me in thanking Professor David Bouget for his talk. All right, and we'll take a five minute break and be back at 6.06. .06. And meanwhile, um, uh, David, if you'd like to briefly chat with Kagman about her comment, and that'd be great, thanks. Sure, thanks, Andre, for allowing me to go over time a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let's see the question. Yeah. So the question is, uh, 
if we suppose that there we have uh, experiences in our sleep, uh, does that mean that we grasp in our sleep? Yeah, uh, you know, it's we have graspy thoughts in our sleep. Yeah, 